Uh, as he gave a great rounding out of the images that Dr. Hastings presented earlier. Uh, but for the non-cardiologists -cardiologi out there in the audience, I want to emphasize that some of the most dram you know, tr dramatic advances in cardiology in recent years have been these devices. And I'm not just saying that because our interventional colleagues organized this symposium. The case begins, it's a 63-year-old gentleman with no uh, just hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a 20-pack year history of tobacco use, who had uh, sun onset, sharp substernal chest pain. Uh, the morning of presentation comes in uh, in the evening. Uh, at home, he's just on a tenol and simvastatin, the relevant some PPI med as well. Uh, his vitals in the emergency room, he was bradycardic with a heart rate of 44, blood pressure was normal, uh, his respirations were normal, and his oxygen saturation was normal as well. Uh, so his EKG uh, demonstrated marked sinus bradycardia, uh, but no major ST T-wave changes. And then his initial uh, laboratory workup in the ER was noble for elevated white count. Uh, the rest of his chemistries were normal. Uh, his cardiac enzymes were elevated, though. And you can that's a trend over the course of the evening and early morning. I'll ask the panel, uh, is there any preference as to therapy now, cath lab, yes? No? Any no's in there? Okay, so we're going to send them to the cath lab, Jay. Okay, well, um, this was probably, I don't know, 6 o'clock or so. So um, he was given aspirin in the emergency room. He was starting a heparin drip admitted to the CCU. He was put on nitroglycerin drip, and his pain went away right away. And so I think because of that, he wasn't taking the cath lab right away, but it was one of the earlier cases the next morning. Uh, so we proceed with angiography, and so I have some representative still frames. Uh, and you can see uh, he's got a very short left main that's a little bit difficult to evaluate, uh, could potentially have some eccentric stenosis there, um, as well as proximal circumflex disease, as well as some uh, LAD disease as well. Uh, and then take a picture of his right coronary artery, uh, and he has 100% occlusion there, appears to be acute. And so now you have a patient with elevated troponins, uh, and how are we going to revascularize him at this point? You want? We're going to proceed with PCI. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, I was uh, about to shoot the subclavian to consider him for cabbage, and Dr. Block is just like, wait, 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 what are you doing? And then, uh, so we uh, proceed with additional diagnostic testing first, because like I was saying, the, um, the left main and the proximal ID uh, and proximal circumflex are a little bit difficult to properly evaluate on just angiography alone. And then Dr. Adler this morning talked about the benefit of additional imaging and physiologic testing. So because the left main was so short, actually the intravascular ultrasound wasn't uh, all that useful in visualizing the actual stenosis, but when we performed FFR in both uh, the LAD and circumflex, you can see that the LAD lesion was significant, but the left circumflex lesion wasn't significant. So, um, Okay, so now in all seriousness, we, we, we do have a patient who we sent for early invasive strategy, and to remind everyone, that means we're going to ask that he be taken to the cath lab within 24 to either 48 to 72 hours after his end STEMI. Uh, the catheterization showed uh, uh, potentially three-vessel disease, but now we know that we have two-vessel disease with prox LED involvement. So the question is, what type of treatment should we proceed with? Is that correct? Yep. And to summarize, so he is non-diabetic, and uh, his LV function is normal as well. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, when you look at the guidelines uh, for a patient like this, uh, they actually defer to the PCI, cabbage, and uh, stable angina guidelines for the specific anatomic subsets to kind of help guide Revascularization, obviously, in patients with uh, ACS, they have a stronger emphasis for actually performing some form of revascularization because the patients are higher risk for recurrent events. Um, and then, so when you look at the stable uh, CAD guidelines, the patient falls into uh, two vessel disease with proximal LAD disease. And so the main two reasons to revascularize are for improvement or survival or relief of symptoms. And then I, I found it was interesting that. Uh, cabbage gets a level of evidence, uh, a class one recommendation level of evidence B, 
for uh, improvement of survival, and PCI is uncertain benefit in that case. Okay, now Dr. Jessen's jumping up and down, and he's, he's playing the virtues of cabbage, uh, but the question, you know, arises as to w when these data were generated, uh, and from an interventional standpoint, what, what generation stents were they primarily using at that time? Because as we heard this morning, and to try to put, put this all together, the later generation stents may have additional benefits. This is an ongoing debate that continues to evolve. Right. So then if you look at the data uh, actually behind this, and so the uh, year of publication I found was interesting. So between 1989 to 1994, and it was mainly comparisons between cabbage and medical therapy at that time, which as we heard from the talk today has also significantly changed. And most of that, uh, you can see in the last column, is uh, actually for left main disease or two or three vessel proximal disease. Only one of the studies uh, had benefit of, of an interaction, so not even the primary study of proximal LAD disease. Um, and then when comparing with PCI, the study is a little bit more recent. Um, but still the most recent one is still 10 years old at this point. And uh, the only distinction is two vessels with greater than 95% proximal LAD benefit for cabbage versus angioplasty. So I'm guessing that that's a go then for the PCI. And so that's what we ended up doing. We uh, PCI'd his right coronary artery. Um, this actually was Christmas Eve, so the patient really wanted to go home for Christmas. And so he's uh, scheduled to come back for his LAD intervention as an outpatient. So uh, quick conclusions, additional imaging or physiologic assessment can definitely assist to characterize angiographically borderline lesions and potentially affect whether the patient goes to surgery or gets PCI. And uh, we probably need more contemporary data re regarding uh, optimal revascularization strategy for patients with two vessel disease involving the proximal LAD. All right, thank you.